When it comes to some of the more unique PC builds, like my Hunan Dual X79 workstation here, benchmarking can reveal some weird quirk you weren't expecting. Sometimes it's a hardware limitation you weren't counting on, other times it's a software issue. So what do you get when you cross a pair of Sandy Bridge Xeons with a GTX 1080 Ti? Well, you get more questions than answers. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So last week I built this workstation based off a Hunan Dual X79 motherboard, which you can check out right up here. The quick rundown is this is based on two Xeon E5 2690 8-core 16-thread CPUs for a total of 16 cores and 32 threads. It's also got 64 gigs of DDR3 ECC memory. The motherboard, CPU, and RAM only cost around $585 together, but how well can it game? I decided to pair the system with a Gigabyte GTX 1080 Ti, not because it's the best match for this build, but in order to suss out any weaknesses of these Xeons when it comes to gaming. As I mentioned in the last video, if you're looking to build a gaming PC, this system shouldn't even be on your shortlist to consider. But if you're in the market for an entry-level professional workstation that has some gaming chops on the weekends, well, this might be right up your alley, but it's not without its caveats. Now before we go too much further, I'm going to address something that I know is going to come up in the comments if I just let it go, and that's the term bottleneck. I hate that word, as it's probably the most misused and misunderstood term in all of PC gaming. And yes, these Xeons are going to hold back the performance of the 1080 Ti's potential performance. That doesn't mean these Xeons are going to hold back all graphics cards in all games. I do not recommend running these CPUs with the 1080 Ti, but I am using the 1080 Ti to demonstrate where the limit is. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the benchmarks and talk about what problems came up during testing. For those that thought there might be some typos or inaccurate numbers in that montage, I thought the exact same thing, which is why I ran the test again a day later after confirming my settings, just to make sure that those numbers were in fact accurate. There are a lot of inconsistent numbers in that data set, so let's see if we can make some sense out of them. Out of the six games tested, Rocket League is the only one that shows any kind of stair-step frame rates that we might expect as we go from 1080p to 1440p up to 4K. However, an interesting artifact of this game was the low frame times experience at 1080. The 1% lows are about 30% lower than they are at the other two resolutions. Both Doom and Wreckfest showed almost no difference between 1080p and 1440p benchmarks, which points to a bit of a CPU limitation here. But both the games were a great experience at any of the tested resolutions. Now, we get to the interesting test results. Sniper Elite 4 actually shows a pretty dramatic increase in frames per second from 1080p to 1440. It was one of the most difficult games to test in my lineup today as well, with loading failures, soft crashes, and blue screens being pretty much the norm. But why this game struggled more at 1080p than at 1440? I have no idea. CSGO was probably the most interesting result in the lineup today, simply because the results were stair-stepped, but in the wrong direction. 1080p performed the worst, averaging 222 FPS and a 0.1% low of 41. Going to 1440p showed both numbers improved to 255 FPS and 47 respectively. The weird thing was that moving to 4K, where our average increased yet again to 261 FPS and a 0.1% low of just 56. I again have no explanation for this one, as CPU and GPU metrics were nearly equal in all of the testing and not showing any bottleneck at any resolution. 
And finally, we make it to GTA V, one of the most well-optimized games for PC. It just didn't seem to like the CPU combo at all. In all of the tests, GPU utilization sat right around 25%, while one or two of the CPU threads were ramped up to 100. The other 30 CPU threads either sat idle or ran at about 5 to 10%. The behavior was very similar to a CPU bottleneck, but the results that I was seeing on the CPU didn't seem to bear that out. Now, some games do have issues like this on multi-socket motherboards, and you can typically work around the problem by setting CPU affinity in Task Manager, that is, assigning specific CPU cores and threads to a process. However, in the case of GTA V, no configuration I tried had any appreciable effect. I tried assigning all threads to a single CPU, I tried assigning only physical cores, assigning only eight threads, nothing really worked. If you're into the whole, I should have just bought a console experience in GTA V, a dual socket motherboard might be exactly what you're looking for. So do I recommend this as a gaming PC? Absolutely not, at least as its primary function. If you were to pair this with a bit more of a conservative GPU, something like a GTX 1070 or RX 580, I think you would see some excellent results. And as a workstation, specifically for tasks that are heavily multi-threaded, this might make sense, especially if your workload requires large amounts of system memory. In the end, is it worth it to go through all of this to build a system like this? As cool as it is, just saying out loud, my computer has 16 cores, 32 threads, and 64 gigabytes of ECC registered memory. For most people, no, I'd recommend going somewhere else. Even if your multi-threaded performance winds up lower by building on a more modern platform, as you can tell from the benchmarks here, single-threaded performance does matter in a number of games and workstation tasks. Look no further than GTA V to show you that you just can't beat the simplicity of a single socket system in some cases. Is there a use for this kind of a system? Absolutely, I think there is. If you want to get into virtualization, having 32 threads and 64 gigs of VCC memory in a system that is quiet enough to be house-friendly isn't a bad option. There are always deals out there on decommissioned server gear, as a lot of you in the comments of the last video wanted to point out to me. But you have to keep in mind that rack mount server gear tends to be A, difficult to work on, B, use proprietary form factors and machine-specific parts, or C, they're insanely loud. A system like this could run silently under your desk, running headless on your network as a file server, Plex, firewall, ad blocker, pretty much everything I've gone over in my How to Free NAS Your House tutorials. But what do you guys think? Despite the shortcomings of the Hunan motherboard, do you have a situation where a build like this makes sense? Let me know down in the comments. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Also make sure to follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing. Strangely enough, it's the same name. As always, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys. That is way harder to do with a full glass. Apparently I didn't drink fast enough. Beer break. Or in this case, cider break. All right, today we have the Rogue Fruit Salad Cider. Uh, it's actually a little bit of a stronger cider. It's a six point, where is it at? 6.4%. That is not a pleasant nose. Hmm. Rogue to the core. Fruit salad cider is inspired by Oregon's rich fruit bounty. It's packed with cherries and plums on Rogue's own farms in Oregon, in addition to apples, pears, marion berries, peaches, and apricots grown on rich Oregon soil. Fruit salad cider is a true taste of the terrier of Oregon. Crafted with eight ingredients, Rogue Farms cherries, Rogue Farms plums, apples, pears, marion berries, peaches, and apricots, and red wine yeast. That's probably what I'm smelling. Is it, it's got a wine smell to it, and I'm not, I'm not used, I wasn't expecting that, I should say. Now that I've, now that I've read red wine on there, uh, that's what it smells like. But when you're expecting like the, the sweet, uh, real rich cider smell to it, and then you get, all you get is a nose full of red wine. Ooh. Hmm. Well, it's more pleasant than the nose is. But I'm not sure I like it. We shall see. It's a much more tart cider than I expected. Um, like I said, there's definitely some notes of red wine in there from that yeast. I mean, like, it, like I said, as soon as I read that, it keyed that into my brain and I went, oh, that's exactly what that is. But I'm having a real hard time pulling out the individual fruit components of this. Uh, I taste a little bit of cherry 
and that's about it. I don't taste any apple. I don't taste any apricots or pears or maybe a little marionberry, uh, but no peaches, uh, no plums. So like I said, I've, I've got the, probably the marionberry and the cherries are what I'm getting more of than anything else. This is again one of those uh, expectation versus uh, reality moments where my expectations when I hear fruit salad cider is this real sweet, thick, luscious uh, uh, fruit cider taste. And what I get was red wine out of the bottle. So the more I drink this, I I'm getting a little bit more accustomed to the taste. It is certainly different and it is certainly not what I expected. Uh, if you're expecting this to go down like a Red's Apple Ale or a, uh, a Spire Cider or something like that, uh, you're going to be sorely disappointed, as I was. Again, expectation versus reality. This is just not that style of cider. You don't want to serve this ice cold. I, I had this ice cold because that's how I'm used to drinking ciders, and it is not a good flavor ice cold. Uh, you get like this harsh red wine flavor, and that's about it. As it's warming up, it's becoming a lot more savory. Uh, there's some other notes that are expressing themselves. It's actually pretty solid. I, I'm Now I am enjoying the flavor now that I know what to expect and how to experience it. 